Well, good morning. Happy Valentine's Day, everyone, as the world celebrates love or the idea of love or the thought of being in love. Every first day of the week, we are reminded of the greatest love man has ever known. As we partake of the memorial, we're reminded that God demonstrated to man the greatest love that we've ever known. Romans 5, 8 says that God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so every first day of the week, we begin our week reminded of that love that God shown to us and knowing that we are to love one another as Christ has loved us. So every, every first day of the week is a day of love for us. This morning's lesson is entitled, Destroyed, with an exclamation point. So shout it, Destroyed. Taking our text from Hosea 4, 6 to 7. I intended this morning to be a lesson that kind of is a stepping stone or a building block for the one tonight. Tonight we're going to be looking at Amos chapter 4 in our song study of the month, Prepare to Meet Thy God. The thing about Hosea and Amos is they were contemporaries. They both went to the northern ten tribes of Israel to try to bring Israel back to God. You remember that they had served the golden calf set up by Jeroboam. Then they had served the Baals and the Asherah that Ahab and Jezebel set up. Now Jehu destroyed that practice, it seems, but then in Jehu's lifetime, he turned back to the golden idol set up by Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. And that seemed to be the sin that would end, end Israel's reign as a monarchy and bring them into exile by Assyria. But in the meantime, there were three prophets that were at least contemporary during the reign of Jeroboam II. That was Hosea, Amos, and Jonah. Now Amos and Hosea both went to the northern tribes, as I pointed out. Jonah went to Nineveh, the capital of Assyria that had been oppressing Israel. And during the, and you can look at 2 Kings 14, 25 and see that Jonah did that during the reign of Jeroboam II and brought it, because of his preaching to Nineveh, what he did not see was it brought about peace and prosperity that the northern ten tribes never knew before and after Jeroboam II's death would never see again. So I wanted to look at the lesson from Hosea who went to the northern ten tribes of Israel and he preached to them why this destruction was coming upon them. And then tonight we'll look at the warning by Amos that they were to prepare to meet their God. One of the things, before we get into Hosea chapter 4, one of the things that Hosea is going to tell them is that they're, they were going to be destroyed for a lack of knowledge, for a rejection of knowledge, and a forgetting of knowledge. But God has revealed His will to mankind from the beginning. With Cain and Abel, Genesis 4, 3-7, through we find that Abel's offering was pleasing before God, but Cain's was not. And even though we don't have a written record telling us exactly what they knew to do, we do know that they knew what to do, and that God even talked to Cain himself and said, If you do what is right, will it not be well with you? But even after such a warning from God himself, what did Cain go out and do? He slew his brother. He became angry, and he took it out on his brother through murder. The law was given to the Israelites in Exodus chapter 20. We find that God delivered the law to Moses in such a powerful way that he said that no man or beast could even touch the mountain. And in fact, when they heard the voice of God, they told Moses, we don't want to hear it. Have God only speak to you because we are terrified of it. And so the law was given to the Israelites. And as we look at the prophets, they went not only to God's people, but also to the nations around them. God didn't just say, I'm going to warn my people. God even warned the nations that didn't even believe in Him. And yet He sent men with powerful signs and wonders to teach them His ways. Jonah went to Nineveh and Assyria. Nahum also went to Nineveh and Assyria. And Nahum would be the last voice of reason that they heard. And they did not listen to Nahum as they had done to Jonah years earlier. And so in, 912, in 612 B.C., Assyria falls. In 609 B.C., the last of Assyria falls, where the king was killed, his brother became king in a refuge citadel, and in 60, by 609, Assyria was no more. Completely wiped off the map by the Babylon. By the Babylon. Obadiah was sent to Edom. In fact, if you look in the book of Obadiah, it says, the very first passage says, Obadiah to Edom. And then gives the prophecy from God that they needed to repent. Isaiah and Jeremiah. Both prophesied to other nations. Both of them were sent to Judah primarily. Isaiah and Jeremiah both were prophets to the kings of Judah and to the people of Judah. But both of them prophesied to other nations on behalf of God. God spoke through them to Egypt, to Assyria, to Babylon, to Edom, to Moab, to Ammon, to Tyre, and Sidon, and others. 
Daniel revealed God's message to Babylonian and Persian kings over a span of about 70 years, if not more. God has spoken through His Son to all men everywhere. In Hebrews chapter 1, 1 to 2, it says, starts off, the Hebrew writer starts telling us the way God used to communicate. He said He had communicated in all manner of variety of ways to all kinds of different people, but to the patriarchs and then to the prophets. And then He says, but in these last days, remember what it says, He has spoken to all men everywhere by His Son. His Son is the final message. <coughs> His Son is the final message word concerning the salvation and the destiny of mankind. In fact, in Acts 17, 30-31, as the Apostle Paul was speaking to the Greeks in Athens, and he was standing in their Areopagus or on Mars Hill, and he told them that God no longer overlooks the times of ignorance. That means there was a time that God allowed ignorance. And he says, but no more. Because of verse 31, there is a day of judgment fixed. God himself having furnished proof by raising Jesus from the dead. God has removed the excuse of ignorance from man. He has warned of the dangers of ignorance, and He's outlined the consequences for ignorance. And we can go back, unless we begin thinking, well, I didn't know it was going to be a great excuse when I stand before God. That's what we're going to be looking at this morning. This is Hosea's message to the people of Israel who ought to have known better. Mankind ought to know better. Jesus was that final word. And yet we're going to see that God has outlined the consequences for ignorance. One of the things about the days of Hosea was they were very troublesome for Israel. With the death of Jeroboam II, he was one of the longest reigning kings over the northern ten tribes, and during his reign, the peace and prosperity grew and grew and grew. And even though he was a wicked, terrible, evil king, the prosperity wasn't given to them because of how righteous he was. You find out from Amos, when Amos goes and prophesies, Amos is sent to say, God gave you such prosperity and peace so that you would return to Him. So that you would repent and return to Him. And give Him the thanks and the praise and the honor due Him for all the peace that they had enjoyed. But instead, what did they do? They adopted option B. Look what, how righteous we must be. We must be doing it right. Because look at all the blessings we have. And instead of accrediting it to God, they credited it to the two golden calves, one in Dan and one in Bethel. And they did not return to God. In fact, Amos goes on in chapter 6 to say, God sent pestilence, He sent famine, He sent an earthquake, He sent all these things, even supernatural things, where it rained in one city and was dry in the next. And they could see the cloud move. And God said, I did all these things that you might return to me, and yet you have not returned to me. So Hosea goes, during the time of Hosea and Amos, this is troublesome times. Jeroboam II dies, and with his death comes a time of political unrest. Six kings in 25 years. Now that might sound like a long period of time, but not when you read that one king can reign for 40 years. One king reigns for 29 years. One king reigns for 30 some odd years. Most of the kings reign for 40 some odd years. Some even up in the 55. And yet, for tw in 25 years, six kings reign. What happened? Assassinations. Invasions. Etc. People rose against the people. Usurpers slayed the king before him, trying to set up a dynasty. And if I remember right, in those six kings, only one was father and son. Only one did his son sit the throne before him, and even that didn't last very long before he was removed from office. And another man usurped the throne. Six kings in 25 years. That is a time of political unrest and instability. instability. The people didn't know who they could trust. What dynasty are they going to have? So it became a time of social problems. Wickedness, you can read in Hosea chapter 7, 1 to 2, God outlines some of the wickedness that was taking place. And it was a time of serious spiritual problems. They still had not turned from their idolatry. Hosea 4, 14, Hosea 8, 5, 10, 5 to 6, 13, 1 to 2, all these different places, God slams them for their idolatry. But then Hosea hits the root of their problem, was lack of knowledge. And not just because no one had taught them, but willful lack of knowledge. And three things that we're going to be talking about this morning. So let's read this passage. Hosea 4, 6-7. It says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you've rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being my priest. Since you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. The more they multiply, the more they sinned against me. I will change their glory into shame. 
and this is a message from God to the northern ten tribes. The implication that I want us to see for us today is that knowledge is one of those must-haves because our souls depend on it. We must have knowledge, and not just any knowledge, but knowledge on God's Word. In 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 through 7, knowledge of God's Word will lead us to exercise self-discipline. Look with me there. Place a marker and Hosea will come back. But I want to thank Greg for the scripture reading this morning and ask you to turn there with me again. 2 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 2. He says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. From the very beginning, before we even get to verse 7, Peter's saying something here in verse 2, that grace and peace are going to be multiplied to his audience through the knowledge of God and of Jesus. Only in that knowledge can we have that peace, can we have that grace. And so he says in verse 3, seeing that his divine power, speaking of Jesus, seeing that his divine power is granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. So again, he's saying that everything is tied to life and godliness through the knowledge of God's word. Knowledge of God's word is therefore very, very important to our souls. So in verse 4 he says, For by these he's granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by us. Now for this very reason also applying all diligence. Remember when we talk about diligence, when we give diligence to anything, it's not half-hearted. You cannot have diligence in something that's half-hearted. Diligence is giving your all. Diligence means to do your best. Whatever it is in your ability to do it, that's what you give it. So he says in verse 5, applying all diligence, he's saying giving it everything that you have in your ability to give, you give it in your faith supply moral excellence and in your moral excellence, knowledge. We display the knowledge of God's word through the way we conduct our lives to those around us. They will see. We don't have to thump the Bible and say, look, I know it. We teach it by living it. We teach it by practice, by applying those truths to our lives. So it comes out in the way we behave around others. It comes out in the way we speak, in the gentleness, the kindness, the patience, and the love that we're able to show one another. So he says, verse 6, and in your knowledge, self-control. See how this, this all kind of goes in chronological order. We can't have self-control against things if we don't have the knowledge of those things that are harmful for us or those that are our good. And so he says, in your knowledge, you need to apply self-control. And remember, he's saying, do these things diligently. And in your self-control, perseverance. When we have that self-control to deny ourselves those things that are wicked, those things that ought to be forbidden, and those things that are forbidden, those things that we ought not to be named among ourselves, when we have that self-control, when the times of tempting come, when those times of trial come, we will have perseverance. So he says, and in your perseverance godliness, by being the right examples, by overcoming those trials, we will, ex we will exemplify godliness. That means we will be like God. We will be like Christ. And he says, and in your godliness, verse 7, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. Then if you go on through verses 8 to 11, you see that if these qualities are yours, you'll never become short-sighted. You won't forget the purging of your past sins. And the entrance to heaven will be abundantly supplied to you. Knowledge of God's word leads us to exercise self-discipline. And leads us to understand what fully love is. To understand that love is not just a warm, fuzzy feeling, but it is a choice. That we choose that relationship with God. We choose that relationship with one another. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 10. It says, Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent. Again, that diligence going back to verse 5. Be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you, for as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. Colossians 1, 9-10 says we cannot be led astray if we have it. As long as we have this knowledge, if we're applying the knowledge of God's word, these things will take place. We will be able to exercise self-control. We'll be able to have perseverance. Why? Because we hang our hat on that hope, that promise that God has made that we'll live with Him forever. In 2 Peter 3 and verse 17, we find that with it we can be on guard against the falsehoods of man. How are people so led astray today? The same way they've been led astray in times past. Willful lack of knowledge. 
or willful giving in to something new it's just because it's new? How many times have we heard that? Oh, it's new. It's got to be good. Well, in some cases, that's true. Phones, cars, different things like that. That's really, that, that might be true. But when it comes to the Word of God, no. It's when once delivered for all the saints, Jude verse 3. That's why we're to be earnest in our contending for it. Israel was destroyed for lack of knowledge. And the sad thing is, the saddest part about all of that is it could have been prevented. And that's Hosea's message in chapter 4, 6 to 7. It could have been prevented. They didn't have to go into obscurity. Do you realize that even though a remnant was promised to the nation of Judah, that after 70 years they would return, no such promise was ever made to the northern ten tribes? That when Assyria marched them off into captivity and dispersed them as was their habit into all the nations around them, they would never return as a nation. Ever. The northern ten tribes were wiped off the face of the map. And something new took place. And it became known as Samaria. And we know what happened in the time of Jesus. Samaria and the Jews were at enmity with each other. They did not consider one another brothers. In fact, to the Jews, a Samaritan was lower than a dog. It went Gentile dog, Samaritan to the Jew. Something new, not something better, came in its place. And it could have been prevented. What did Hosea say? He said in verse, four, verse 6 of chapter 4. That his people were destroyed for lack of knowledge. God had taught Israel. And that's what I want us to see. Is that it wasn't a lack of knowledge that they just didn't know. That they, they didn't know what God's word or command was. God had taught Israel the patriarchal law from Adam to Jacob, Genesis 18, 17, and 19. God had told them we may not have the written record of exactly what he expected of them, but we do have the record saying they knew what God expected of them. And then we have the Mosaical law from Moses to Jesus, Galatians 3, 8 to 25, refers to it as a tutor or a schoolmaster that led the people to understand what Christ was going to do. And it brought them to Christ. And so from Moses to Jesus... You have the Mosaical Law. And as we look through the book of Exodus all the way through Deuteronomy, where we see the law given and reiterated and repeated over and over and over again, that law, we do know what they needed to do to be pleasing unto God. Galatians 3, 23-25, we're told that the law of Moses was a guide to Christ. It was how they could know Christ was coming. And yet, we find that those days come, the time is fulfilled, and who follows the star to fall down at the feet of the newborn babe. Who falls down at his feet with gifts? Not the Jews, not the Pharisees or the Sadducees or the religious leaders of their day, not the priests at the temple, but magi from the east. Wise men from the east came to fall down at the feet of a toddler or a, or, or a younger. We know that Herod destroyed the children, the male children, two years and younger. So he was somewhere in that range. And yet it wasn't the Jews. It was Magi from the East. And they were without excuse. They had the law. If Magi from the East could follow their own law and follow a star right to Jesus' house, why couldn't the Jews? It was their law. They were experts in it. And yet their reaction was kill him. Kill him. And then as he grew older, the message was kill him. He needs to be put to death. They knew better. They had the law. And as we look at these reasons for Israel's lack of knowledge, I want you to ask the question, are these the same today? Could these very same reasons be applied today? The reason for Israel's lack of knowledge, turn with me back to Hosea. I say we'd get back there. Still in chapter 4, we're going to look in verse 1. One of the reasons was the parents did not train their children properly. Now this was a law of Moses that they were to teach their children the law. In fact, when we see that they crossed over the Jordan River into Canaan, finally the fulfillment to the promise made to Abraham. What did Joshua do at the command of God? God commanded him to set up a memorial too. One in the middle of the stream where they walked and one on the side where they crossed. Twelve stones. Do you remember why? Joshua was told to erect those monuments. Remember why? So that when their children asked, what are these stones 
they could tell them what God had done. Remember what happens in the book of Judges? We read that a generation grew up that knew not God. And so that every man did what was right in his own sight. Israel constantly, constantly was guilty of this, of not training their children properly. But here in Hosea chapter 4 and verse 1, he says, Listen to the word of the Lord, O sons of Israel, for the Lord has a case against the inhabitants of the land, because there is no faithfulness or kindness or knowledge of God in the land. The priests were to teach the people. The people were to teach their children. And God says there is no faithfulness and no knowledge of God in the whole land. So the priests didn't do their jobs. The parents didn't do their jobs. So that wickedness abounded. In Proverbs chapter 22, place your marker there in Hosea. We'll come back. In Proverbs chapter 22, Proverbs 22, verse 6. It says, Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he'll not depart from it. And if you look in Ephesians 6, 4, that's where we're told that the responsibility of training children up in the admonition and nurture of the Lord falls on the parents, especially the fathers. And it has always been that way. That's not what, Ephesians 6, 4 is nothing new to God's people. He's saying just as the Israelites had to do it, now as Christians... You ought to train your children in the way they ought to go. The reasons for Israel's lack of knowledge is the parents did not train their children properly. And so there's no faithfulness and no knowledge of God to be found in the land. Don't we see the same today? People not training their children in the way that they ought to go. Second reason for their lack of knowledge is they stopped giving heed to the Lord. Look in Hosea 4 and verse 10. He says, they will eat but not have enough. They will play the harlot but not increase because they have stopped giving heed to the Lord. What does that mean, give heed? When someone says, give heed to me or you heed the warning, as the song says we're going to look at tonight, heed the warning, it means listen. When you give heed to something, it means you listen. And it's more than just listening. We can listen and hear and do nothing. We could hear and yet it not affect us one way or the other. That's not what heed means. Heed means to listen and act. When you give heed to something, it means you listened to it and you took its advice or its warning or you acted in some way based on what you heard. It's not, that's why it's not listen or hear, it's heed. They stopped giving heed to the Lord. That means they stopped listening to His Word and they stopped acting on it. And so wickedness is bound. In James 1, 21 and 25, this is the same thought. As far as reasons go today, James said, don't be a hearer of the word only. He said, but be a hearer and a doer. Be a hearer and prove yourselves doer of the word. There's a lot of people that will hear it. There's a lot of people that will listen to it. There's a lot of people that read it and know it and they can quote the word of God. But it bears very little resemblance to their life. It bears very little influence over their conduct, over their speech, over what they do and say. Though they can claim it, they can act pious, they can sound pious, but when it comes to their lives, it really means nothing. So it's not enough to hear it. That's what James is saying. You must be a doer of it. And that's what Hosea was accusing the Israelites of doing. They stopped giving heed to the Lord. They knew it, but they hadn't taught it. And they stopped listening to it and making it applicable in their lives. And the sad thing is, we can read in Hosea 4, 12 to 13, they had idols in the home. Look in Hosea 4, starting in verse 12. My people consult their wooden idol, and their diviner's wand informs them. For a spirit of harlotry has led them astray, and they've played the harlot, departing from their God. They offer sacrifices on the tops of the mountains and burn incense on the hills, under oak, poplar, and terebinth, because their shade is pleasant. Therefore your daughters play the harlot, and your brides commit adultery. Without knowledge of God, they're going to worship the creature rather than the creator. They're going to commit adultery. They're going to play the harlot, meaning that they are, they are forsaking God for something else. They've forsaken that covenant that they made with him. All the way back in the days of Abraham, this covenant was established. It was, it was strengthened and enforced under the Mosaic law that they would be the, God's people and he would be their God. And God is saying over and over, they are... Committing adultery, not only physically, but also in a spiritual sense, 
and that they have left God. Before Gideon could serve God, he had to get rid of the idols in his home. Look with me in Judges chapter 6 and verse 25. You cannot serve God and yet serve something else. Before Gideon could even do what God wanted him to do, notice what the command to Gideon was. And we know the man that Gideon became and the victories that he won for God and the faithfulness that he exhibited over and over throughout his life and that he was an awesome judge and deliverer of God's people. But notice what had to happen first in Judges 6, verse 25. Now on the same night, the Lord said to him, speaking to Gideon, Take your father's bull and a second bull seven years old and pull down the altar of Baal, which belongs to your father, and cut down the Asherah that is beside it. So here at Gideon's own household, in his father's house, a Baal and an Asherah. And God says to Gideon, Before you can serve me and bring the heart of the people to me, you must first take care of the idols in your home. Get rid of them. In this case, very physical sense. Gideon went and destroyed them. Broke them to pieces. And in the morning, the people were upset. And yet Gideon's father said, Let them let Baal, if he's angry, contend for himself. Let the Asherah, if she's angry, contend for herself. At least he demonstrated some kind of common sense regarding those idols. But before Gideon can serve, he had to get rid of the idols. What was happening here is families were not trained in the law of God, and so they turned to their wooden images, their images carved out of stone. As we looked at, over the course of several weeks, we looked at in two lessons what modern-day idolatry looks like. Colossians 3, 5 says, anything that gets in the way of our service to God is idolatry. Our covetousness, our evil desires, our greed can be so much that it can amount to idolatry because we crown it in our lives, not God. Certainly, in a very physical and real sense, this is what was happening in Israel. Anything that takes us away from God is idolatry. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, you cannot serve two masters. You're going to love the one, you're going to hate the other. You cannot serve God and wealth or money. You can't do it. You have to choose. And that's why he says, put your trust in me, verse 33. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things, the necessities of life, going back to verse 19, will be taken care of. We have the Word of God today, but the question is, do we read it? We have it, but do we read it? There's a lot of homes that have Bibles prominently displayed on a coffee table or a shelf somewhere that's prominent in the house, but they don't know what it says. They don't ever open it. When I used to uh, go all over the peninsula delivering home medical supplies, there was a house that I, I particularly enjoyed visiting with the lady there, but one of my very first visits that I came to her home, she had this very large family Bible that looked very similar to a family <coughs> Bible that I grew up with. My parents had a big family Bible. It was kind of soft leather bound cover and it had our family tree all listed in it. And it had certain art that was in there that depicted certain events. And it sat on our coffee table and we read it all the time. In fact, I liked it so much when I started my family, I found one on eBay that looked just like our Bible I grew up with, and we bought it. And so now we have that. But I saw one that was very similar in design and color. But I also noticed it had about an inch thick of dust covering the cover. And I asked her about it. And she said, oh yeah, this has been in our family for at least three generations. And it's just been passed down and passed down. And it's got wonderful information about our family on the inside. And I asked her, there's a lot more wonderful information in there than just your family tree. Do you know what it says? Well, no, I'm not very religious. <coughs> then why do you have it? For some people, it's just that's that's what they like. They want they want it out there so people can see it. All she wanted to tell you about was the family tree information inside that Bible. But there's so much more in there that could provide her with life eternal. But she ignored it. She has it right there in front of her. So when she stands before God and she says, well, I didn't know, without excuse. And that's what Hosea was saying to Israel. You are without excuse. We have it today. 2 Timothy 2.15 tells us we are to be diligent in our study of that word of God. So much so that we can accurately handle it. That we can rightly divide it. Telling the difference between truth and error. Truth from lie. Truth from falsehood. That's what it does for us when we diligently apply it to our lives. We have the Word of God today, but do we read it? Or 
Do other things take its place so it gets lost in the shuffle of day to day? Do we search for it as diligently as we do the TV remote? I saw something uh, last week, last week was Super Bowl 50, and I saw someone post something that said, are you as excited to assemble with the saints as you are to watch the Super Bowl? You know, if you think about the answer to that question, it tells a lot about who you are. It tells a lot about who you are and what you know. Do you search for it as diligently as you do the remote? I know when the remote's lost, I, I, I've been described as a crazed bear. I go after it. The kids move out of my way, or they tell me what, they spill their guts and tell me what they did with it. They understand. You don't get between me and the remote. But do we search after God's word that same way? Do we have that same diligence that we want to know it and apply it to our lives in the same way? Are we as excited to meet with the saints on the first day of the week, every week, as we are to watch a game? A lack of knowledge is no excuse. We're to study to know His will for our lives. The second thing Hosea said about Israel is they were destroyed for rejecting knowledge. <coughs> he says, because you've rejected knowledge, I also reject you from being my priest, in verse 6. Israel knew better. They had the knowledge, but they rejected God's law for their own. What was their own? The sin of Jeroboam, 1 Kings 12, 26-33. We get the account of Jeroboam setting up the two golden calves, one in Dan and one in Bethel, so that they didn't have to go to Jerusalem every year. It was self-preservation. So that when they went to Jerusalem, they didn't get caught up in the love affair of the Davidic king, the rightful king over Jerusalem, and say, we need to kill Jeroboam. And so he said, I'm going to give them feast days that rival that, that God set up, and I'm going to give them a, a golden idol right there in Bethel, Right over the right before they cross the border into Judah. And if they're in the middle of the country or in the north, they can go to Dan. They don't even have to travel all the way to Bethel. So his became a religion of convenience. And to his discredit, the narrators of the Chronicles and the Kings measure every king of the northern ten tribes as a measuring stick for how they how they serve those golden idols. Do you remember what they'd say? He did not depart from the sin of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who caused Israel to sin. And some variation of that phrase. Over and over, that's the measuring stick of the kings of the north. As they were measured to how they lived up to the sin that Jeroboam <coughs> caused the people to sin. All the way until they were swept away by Assyria. People today willfully reject God's way for traditions and creeds of men. The doctrines of men have become more important than the word of God. So much so that when people come to your house, oftentimes they're holding something else. They might have a Bible with them, but they want to read from something different. That's what they want to study with you, and they call it a Bible study. But they don't want to read from the Bible. They want to read from their doctrine, their creed, their manual. Something written by men. I'll say it. You know, this is what was happening in the days of Israel during Jesus' time. Jesus reminded the leaders of his day that Isaiah's prophecy still applied to them. In Mark chapter 7, verse 9, and the same account in Matthew 15, 7, 9, when he quotes from Isaiah, when he says, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me, teaching his precepts or commandments, the doctrines and traditions of men. Then in Mark 7, verse 9, he says, You are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition." Don't we see that applied to people still today that did not get the message? There are people today that are experts at setting aside the commandment of God so that they might keep their tradition. In the days of Israel, in Hosea's day, they had set aside the truth of God for something else. Idolatry. We read Hosea 4, 12-13. Over two lessons, we looked in Romans 1, 25, that talked about Paul was telling the Roman saints that people of his time period, and it still happens today, serve the creature rather than the creator. And that creation alone leaves man without excuse. What was happening in Israel in Hosea's days, the authority of God meant nothing to them. Many today have the same problem. They reject the authority of God. They reject the authority of Christ so that they may do the things that are pleasing to them. But... Rejecting knowledge is no excuse. To know it and not do it is sin. James 4.17 says, The one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. That means he missed the mark. He transgressed 
the law of God. So what was happening is they had the knowledge. They had God's word. They could have read it. But they were lacking it. Part of the reason they lacked it is because they rejected it. They said, nope, we want something else. And they held on to the sin that Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, committed them, caused them to commit. They held on to their idolatrous practices rather than submitting to the word of God. And people today do the same thing. They will have lack of knowledge because they reject it. And the last thing that Hosea says about them in, verse, in chapter 4, verse 6, is he says they were destroyed for forgetting knowledge. Oh, isn't this, but isn't this applicable? We forget things all the time. We can't be held accountable to the things we forget, can we? Notice what he says. Verse 6, Since you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. If they had applied diligence in learning the law of God, they would have never forgotten it. When you apply diligence to anything in your life, whether it's a particular career or a study in school so that you might have that job one day, you don't forget it. It's something that becomes a part of you. And so when we diligently apply God's word to our lives, we won't forget it. See, they had willfully forgot it. They had the knowledge of God, but they forgot it. Look in Hosea chapter 2 and verse 13. He says, I will punish her for the days of the Baals, when she used to offer sacrifices to them, and adorn herself with her earrings and jewelry. He's talking about nation, the nation of Israel in general. And follow her lovers, so that she forgot me, declares the Lord. Do you see how they forgot God? It wasn't one of those things where we absentmindedly misplace our keys, or like this morning I panicked. I knew I had to record her with me, and I put it in my, ja my jacket pocket, since I don't have a shirt pocket. And I got up here and I reached for it to put it on the podium and it was gone. And I went running out through the parking lot thinking it must have slipped out. I went all the way to my car only to find it in the seat of my car. It had fallen out of that pocket. It's not that I had forgotten it. As I had absentmindedly misplaced it. It had fallen out. That's not what he's saying. They didn't just absentmindedly forget God. They forgot God by replacing him with something else. Did you catch that? I will punish her for the days of the balls when she used to offer sacrifices to them and adorn herself with her earrings and jewelry and follow her lovers so that she forgot me. They forgot God because they put something else in his place. That's how they forgot God. And that's what happens still today. People put something else in the place of God. Look in Hosea chapter 8 and verse 14. God says something very interesting here. He says, Israel forgot her maker. And that has meaning in all manner of ways. In Hosea 8, and verse 14, For Israel has forgotten his maker and built palaces. And Judah has multiplied fortified cities. But I'll send a fire on its cities that it may consume its palatial dwellings. Israel forgot her maker. We talk about God being our maker. When someone will die, they'll say, you know, make peace with your maker. They're about to kill them. And what that's saying is we're recognizing that God is the creator. God made each and every individual Israelite. But it's more than that. They were not a nation when God called them out of Egypt. What were they? They were slaves. They were nobodies. They were on the lower totem pole of other people that put their feet on their necks and made them make bricks and made them build all their structures. So when God says they forgot their maker, it's more than just the individual I created you. It's I created you as a nation. I built you up. I brought you out with a mighty hand. And I made you what you are. And you forgot me. That's the accusation. Israel forgot the man. There are various ways people today can forget God's word. Some of it we've talked about. It all plays hand in hand. It happens when we cease to read it and study it. We are to be diligent in these studies. 2 Timothy 2, 15. It can happen when we no longer apply it to our lives. We need to use it or lose it. This is what happened to the Hebrew audience. In Hebrews 5, 12 to 14, they ought to have been teachers, and instead they needed someone to come and teach them. And not just anything, but he says they needed to be taught the basics. How sad. That's the same accusation that Israel was receiving. They lacked, they rejected, and they had forgot the law of God. And the Hebrew writer says to his audience, you need someone to come and teach you the basics. 
the elementary principles because they did not apply it. Many have not grown in Christ, but rather there are many that mature in their weaknesses. It happens that men today can forget God's word when they willingly and willfully put it from their minds. 2 Peter 3, 1 to 7 talks about this when he says in the last days mockers will come or scoffers and they're going to mock the word of God and they're going to say oh look how long it's been it's it's everything's continued since creation and God has still not made his promises and he says I like how it reads from the New King James in verse 5 they willfully forget that there was a flood they willfully forget that fact. they say it's continued on since creation no God flooded the world and destroyed the wicked people of that generation. And he says they willfully forget. Or it escapes their notice in another translation. They forget it. Why? It's not that it's not there and not recorded that we can read it. It's that it doesn't fit their agenda. That information doesn't fit their mantra. Of, oh, we can do whatever we want. Because God's never going to fulfill the promise that he made. And that's why they're called mockers. We can do the same thing if we don't remember the word of God concerning the return of Christ. If we don't keep that in the forefront of our mind, we'll become like them and decide we can do whatever we want. And before long, you act as if there is no God. There are people who only see in the now. And they forget God's promises. And that's to willfully forget what is said about all those heroes of faith we can read in Hebrews 11. It said, these died not receiving the promises, but knowing that it would happen knowing that they could have returned at any opportunity to where they came from, but instead they looked to a better country. And in that vein, God has created a home, an eternal home for us. So many people only see in the now. They don't look long term. They don't see where their soul is headed. Forgetting knowledge is no excuse. Because whether we forget it, reject it, or we just lack it, the consequences won't change or go away. We will not change the consequences. I can forget about gravity and walk off a building, and my forgetfulness isn't going to save me from that fall. I'm still going to suffer the consequence. And the same thing will happen when I bend the knee before God. I either will bend the knee having expected it, having done it in this life, and so it's no big thing, and ready to praise Him for eternity. Or I'm going to bend the knee and praise Him and go to an eternal hell. Israel would be punished for her lack of knowledge, they were taken away by Assyria in 721, 722 B.C., never to be seen as a nation ever again. They were destroyed for lack of knowledge. They were rejected as priests for rejection of knowledge, and their children were forgotten for forgetting knowledge. And the sad thing is, it was all preventable. It was all preventable. They had God's Word. You know, today, God has promised consequences for ignorance of His Word to all men. <coughs> Eternal separation from His glory. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7-9 says when Jesus returns and with flaming fire and his angels dealing out retribution or vengeance on two categories of people. Those who never knew God whether they forgot, whether they rejected, whether they never heard it it's no excuse. And those who never obeyed the gospel. And that includes people that Satan has in his grasp that think they've obeyed the gospel but they've done it according to the traditions of men. God says they will go away into eternal destruction, away from the presence of the Lord. Whether from ignorance or willfully, those who do not know God and do not obey God will be eternally separated from Him and punished. And in Acts 17, in Acts 17, 30-31, God no longer overlooks ignorance, but requires all men everywhere to repent because there is a day of judgment. And in John 12, verse 48, Jesus said it doesn't matter if men reject Jesus or reject God's word for that matter because his word that he spoke will be there on that last day and will judge men. So it doesn't matter if we reject God's word. We will still be judged by it. And so the sad thing is, as we look at these things, is it's totally preventable. It's absolutely preventable. No man has to spend an eternity away from the presence of the Lord. But when they choose to go through life their own way, serving whoever they please, they will suffer that eternal penalty. People who know the right thing to do must do it. James 1.22 says, But prove yourselves doers of the word, and not merely hearers who delude themselves. 
James 4.17 says, Therefore, to the one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. Israel knew God. They knew better. But they had willfully forgot God and they were destroyed. God's word stood as their judge. Do you see the parallel? God did it before. And so when he says he's going to do it again, we have every assurance that promise is true. They had God's word. And by the very word they lacked, by the very word they rejected and forgot, that is what they were judged by. Because Moses said long ago, when they entered the promised land, if you forget God's word, if you no longer are obedient to it, you choose not the blessing, but you choose the curse. And you will be swept away. And they forgot that. And that's exactly what happened to them. The admonition this morning as we look at these Old Testament examples, and we see the parallels in our lives today, is let us never be guilty of a lack of knowledge. Let us never be guilty of rejecting that knowledge. And let us never be guilty of forgetting God's word. But let us be diligent in studying and applying these things to our lives. So that in that way, as we read in 2 Peter chapter 1, that in that way, we will never stumble. And the entrance into heaven will be abundantly supplied. If we can assist you in any way this morning. If you're subject to an invitation in any way. If you're not a Christian, you need to be. To repent and be baptized, no longer living for yourself. But living for the one that died and paid your debt of sin. Demonstrating such great love. That while we are yet sinners... Christ died for us. If you're a Christian in sin, don't be like Israel. They lacked knowledge. They forgot knowledge. They rejected knowledge. They forgot their God. They forgot their priorities. And they were punished for it. The same can happen to us today. If, you're not a, if you are a Christian not living the way that you want, you have the time to be renewed, to repent and make it right. If we can assist you in any way this morning, come forward and let it be known now. While, we, while together we stand and while we sing.